So I'm going to give you some prompts and uh, you just tell me what you think, what comes into your mind. It can be a one word answer. It can be a sentence, how, however, however long you want to go. All right. So first thing is, what's your favorite hallmark of aging? And, and I found a picture of you smiling in, in this one. So. <laughs> uh, it's definitely going to be mitochondrial dysfunction. Awesome. I agree. All right. Then what's your least favorite? This was the, the sternest face I could find for you on the internet. Oh. Yeah, definitely <laughs> telomere attrition. No offense okay. to the people studying that. Telomere shortening, got it. Yeah. All right, where do you stand on low protein versus low carb? This may be a complicated one, but uh, quick answer. Um, neither. Fair yeah, enough. I mean, I mean, I, I so so I'm kind of in the camp now that says I I I'm. I'm not convinced that low protein makes sense, despite some of the epidemiology. I, I think that's a mistake. Um, I think that's an artifact of suboptimal epidemiology. And I think the reality of it is sarcopenia is a far greater risk to the aging person. Um, and I think the evidence from clinical trials is pretty clear that the RDA for protein, which is something on the order of 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight is woefully low to maintain and grow adequate muscle as we age and that we probably need to be closer to about a gram per kilogram. Awesome. So we'll do a deeper dive on that one at another time. So I think this is a really important topic that, you know, gets a lot of popular attention for sure. Um, all right. What about, we talked about exercise and I, and I think I know the answer. It's probably going to be both, but, um, but if you can only do one, where would you focus your attention or what's most important? I mean, I can tell you by time, um, you know, cause I track this stuff really well. I do track how many met hours per week I'm doing of exercise and I'm doing far more met hours of cardio. So a met hour, right. Is how many mets I'm doing times how many hours I'm doing it. So if you look at my strength training is probably six hours per week, but it's probably only four to five met hours, uh, sorry, mets per hour. So that's a much smaller fraction of my expenditure of energy than in cardio. Yeah. And, but that said, you know, Matt, within cardio, 80% of my cardio is at zone two. Right. So 80% right. of that long amount of cardio is at a level where lactate is below two millimole, but, yeah. but not too far below. So just below, just kind of at below two millimole. And I know you've talked a lot about that on your podcast. So certainly I would, I would encourage people listening to go, go check out those episodes. Really, really informative biology who's the little guy in the back doing the the curls there <laughs> yeah that's my youngest who uh, awesome. likes to sometimes come in the gym and do deadlifts with me great um okay so now this is getting a little bit into the, the weeds here uh you know there's a debate in the field about the the inbred mouse strains versus the genetically heterogeneous i couldn't find a picture of um hep3 so we got we got rich so, yeah 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 no, yeah no, of no. course rich, we all know that our good friend rich miller is not a um hep3 mouse <laughs> but he is an advocate for the um hep3 so what are your thoughts here i i i'm a, i'm in favor of what the itp is doing matt i i think i mean i think you know my bias here i think that it's it's much more rigorous and i think it's far less susceptible to um to just the incredible cancer prone behavior we see in a mouse that's basically genetically homozygous at every locus. Yeah. yeah. And of course, people are genetically heterogeneous. So if, yeah. if, yeah. if your goal is to model what might be relevant in people, the one thing I would say about that is it would be great if we could buy old UM het threes commercially right now to shorten your experiment time, you're kind of stuck uh, with, uh, with black six that you can buy. Yeah. So tell me, Matt, what's the, what's the limitation to that? Like what, why is that not a problem that can Jax be solved by actually, throwing more money at it? Yeah. I think Jax is actually, I think it's a supply and demand partly Jax knew there was demand for the old black sixes. So they developed that first. It's my understanding that they are developing the UM het threes to be commercially available. But of course, when you start that production line to get two year old mice, it takes two years before you can start yeah, selling. Yeah, so, so, so it's, a, it's a bit of a chicken egg thing, right? You've got to right. create enough demand to say, we know that this thing's going to be in demand. And, and, and again, that's a great example. It's not sexy because I think people on the outside of the lab don't <laughs> think about that. But yeah. it's like, wouldn't it be interesting to just change the standard and say, right. we're all going to kind of agree that in two years, this is the way we're going to go. This is what the projected demand is going to be for these mice. Let's ramp up the production. Yeah. And it takes a while to, it absolutely takes a while yeah. to get there. Um, okay. I think this came off your website. Um, 
Uh, and I, I have to say, I, uh, I have an undergraduate degree in mathematics, and I have absolutely no idea what this graphic is showing, except that <laughs> longevity is somehow a function of lifespan and health span. So, you know, we have these debates in the field uh, and outside the field, too, right? Should we talk about health span? Should we talk about lifespan? Um, very generic. What are your what are your sort of general thoughts around this this question? Two, two, two thoughts, right? The first is they're they're highly coupled. Right. Yeah. So I think people tend to have this discussion in the abstract, like I have to pick one or the other. These are independent or even worse. These are inversely correlated. Like if I pick one, I'm losing the other. No, that's not. That's almost without exception, Matt. Every intervention that you have to improve lifespan is going to on some level improve health span and vice versa. I'll frame this another way, though. This is the, this is now a completely clinical approach to this. Every single patient who comes in my practice, I sit down with them for a couple of hours on our first day. And at the end of the intake, I ask the exact same question. When you were in the marginal decade of your life, this is defined, I define this as the last decade of your life. So we're all going to have a marginal decade. Right. And I tell most people, you usually don't know the day you enter it, but most people know it by the time they're midway into it. Uh, you know, outside of people dying, you know, suddenly and things like that, right? Yeah. And I say, what do you want to be true in your marginal decade? Because the more clearly we can define your marginal decade, the better chance we have at reverse engineering you out of it, right? If you tell me, look, I hope my marginal decade is 86 to 96, and I want to be able to do these things. Okay, well, if you want to be able to do those things at 90, you need to be able to do these things at 80 and these things at 70 and these things at 60 and these things at 50 where you are today. And no, you can't do them. So we have some work to do. But almost without exception, most people are focused on health span. When, I, when yeah. you push them on this question, they care much more about the quality of their life than the length of their life. And I, again, I remind them, you, you can probably get some both here. You know, I don't think we're talking about 20 year changes in lifespan, but I think if you do everything right, we're talking about a 10 year change in lifespan, but more importantly, it's how much your health span improves. Yeah, that, that's great. That was a, that was a nugget of insight right there that I didn't necessarily expect to get out of this slide. Thank you. For I, that. I'm violating the speed round. Sorry. Yeah, no, that was perfect. All right. Only a few more. This should be easy. Rapamycin or resveratrol? Wait, what's resveratrol? <laughs> Good answer. Okay, here's a harder one. Nicotinamide riboside or NMN? <laughs> oh, God. The, you, you, uh, how, how much trouble am I going to get right in there. here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, this one might be a little bit more challenging. Where do you see the most promise, rapamycin or, or cellular reprogramming at this point? You know, it probably depends on the time scale, Matt. I think this would be one of those things where if you said, what has more promise in the next five years, I think and when we say rapamycin, I think we're really talking about rapalogs and, and mTOR biology, right? Um, I, I, I don't want to say I'm like a reprogramming bear, but I'm probably a short-term reprogramming bear. I, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not fully sold on some of the data that's out there to date, truthfully. Um, and I think some of the holy grail stuff just doesn't make sense. You know, I just don't see us reprogramming neurons back to the place we want them to be. Yeah. yeah. So, so it might be that, look, there's some middle ground, right? Where when it comes to cartilage, when it becomes to certain types of cells, there is an ability to reprogram and that can be, you know, very targeted and, and, and fantastic. But I think the way it's talked about now, I'm probably a little less optimistic again, at least in the next five years. And then who knows, like, you know, it's just, I don't think I'm smart enough to tell what's going to be going on in 20 years. And, and, and I'd love to be, I'd love it to be the case that in 20 years, we can turn cardiac myocytes of an 80 year old back into that of a 20 year old. But you know, this, this brings up a broader question, right? Like I was, I was, I had dinner with a friend last night whose grandmother is 105. Wow. Okay. Lives in Japan, completely has her wits about her. Okay. So just, you know, physically she's quite frail, but cognitively she's, she's sharp. And I said, you know, well, okay, so, you know, your father, who is, you know, his dad's mom, and your father's here in the U.S. She's in Japan. She she hasn't, you know, she has no other family left. She lives in kind of a senior's home. And again, in, in Japan, a senior's home is still a pretty nice place to live, as you can imagine. The Japanese have great reverence for their for their for their older citizens. But I said, what's what's a day in the life like for her? And he's like, you know, she she you know kind of does this does that. And I said, 
how many friends does she have? And he said, well, yeah, that's kind of the thing. She keeps making friends with people and they keep mm -hmm. dying. Um, right. And, and I, I so, so, so I sometimes think of this as a thought experiment, right? Which is like, you know, if someone could say, if someone said to you, Matt, you know, I'm going to grant you eternal youth, you can be 50 years old forever. Would you take it? I think the answer is absolutely not, unless it was there for everyone I cared about. Right. right. Um, you know, the sort of the, 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 the Wolverine problem of you just keep watching everybody die. So, um, Again, this brings it back to your other question. I think health span should really be the thing that most people think about. Um, and not to say that reprogramming can't be a part of that, but um, we'll see. I guess I'm just skeptical yeah. so far. No, I, and I, I think, you know, as you know, I, I share a little bit of that skepticism and, and time will tell, right? I think it's, it's great to have something that looks like it could have really pretty big impact but time will tell how big that impact is actually going to be. So for now, we'll stick with rapamycin, I think is the answer. In the short term, yeah. Yeah. And so